a blessed Sabbath. I was going to announce who's coming up next, but I think it's me. So, all right. So look, welcome again, uh, family, and it's great to see our church family in our church building this morning. Well, some of our church family in our church building this morning. And I'm, look, I want to say the, the real application of our message this morning, I've entitled it, last, last week was preparing for a new normal or preparing for the promised land. Today was entering the promised land, entering the promised land. And if you have a Bible with you, Numbers chapter 14 is where we will be today. Uh, the real application of our message today, a family, whether you're in our church or you're viewing from home, the real application is in our discussion panel, which will be on in about 15 minutes. Uh, so we have a discussion panel here this, uh, this morning, and uh, we will discuss uh, and put some real application uh, to our... In, w don't we live in a, in a whole new world now? We, we live in a brave new world, don't we? And <clears throat> where, we, where we're, we are pushed to do things like we've never done before. Uh, the Time magazine labeled the last 10 years, the last decade, between 2010 to, to 2019, two words. They labeled it with two words. The Time magazine, if you look it up, you'll find it. Disaster and greed. They've labeled the next 10 years, this is the new decade, 2020. Next 10 years, they've labeled it with one word. And that one word, who can ever guess what that one word is? Starts with F, ends with R. Thank you. They've labeled from 2020 and the next 10 years with one word, fear. Fear. People are fearful when we're looking around at what's happening today. Well, folks, what do you, what, what do you think? What do you think people, do you th what do you think they might be fearful of? Any, any thoughts? Can you say, say that again? Oh, someone said coronavirus. True. Dying from it? Okay. Anyone else? What else do you think people could, would, could be fearful of? Losing their jobs is a big one. Oh my goodness, it's incredible, losing their jobs, and that has a ripple effect into every family that has to go through that. Any, anything else? Financial. Financial. You know, that's, if you've noticed on the, well, you probably have, you know, it's, I was interested to see the impact that it's making even within the families, and there's been rise, things like, you know, domestic violence. This, you see the rise in alcohol consumption? They reckon one in five Australian families have... One in five Australian families uh, uh, consume alcohol. And this was taken back in March. So there's how many families here? One, two, three, four, five. okay. But one in five. And they, and they say that uh, has risen by 20%. And you've probably seen that on the news constantly. You know, people are fearful. What else? I, 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 one, one more chance. What else? Uh, say that again. Oh, yes, Absolutely. Has, look, at, look at the impact that's made for us today and, and where we are. We've, yes, Ethel. The Bible says, hmm. down in front of the sign, hmm. says, fear hearing those things which are coming upon the earth. Hmm. Hmm. And, and we've heard recently about China sending yeah. those loaded planes over Taiwan. Hmm. Absolutely. You look everywhere. You know, I had to turn off the news at one stage. I just, I felt the more, the more I kept watching it, the more anxious I was becoming, the more fearful I was. I had to switch it off and just keep my distance away from it because the more I'm looking at it, you know, the more, you know, where, where you're focusing is what's going to consume you. It's what's going to consume you, you know. Um, and, you know, 10 years ago, the latest iPhone they had was an iPhone, iPhone 3. Ten years ago. Ten years ago, there was no Netflix. You couldn't watch Netflix on your phone. Ten years ago, there was not even an iPad. Ten years ago. The fastest internet was 2G. Ten years ago. You couldn't take selfies ten years ago. You had to... You did all digital cameras, remember those? Digital cameras? 
and you upload it up somewhere, then you can show your... You know, I wonder what the next 10 years is going to bring us. I know 10 years' time for me, I'll be 31. I think. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm happy you didn't hear what Peter said just then. No, I'm just kidding. 10 years. <laughs> uh, Yeah, being tied up in someone else's drama. Yeah, thanks. I wish you could heal the stuff from home. Maybe we'll, next time we'll have to, yeah, let's have a roving mic. I've, I've only got 10 minutes, so I'm not going to do that uh, now. But look, this is what I, I've really missed having this. When I'm up here, I love hearing from you. I'll ask a question, and I'd love to hear from you. So thank you. Thank you for coming in today, in this church today. You know, when I was 21, ooh, a couple of years ago, uh, one of my, my, my parents gave me a gift, and me and my sister went to Samoa. And it was, I went to Samoa for the very first time. And when I was 21, you know, they, it, went, it was interesting. My family in the islands, when, because I'd grown up in Australia basically all my life, I was born in New Zealand, came over when I was about nine. And, and I lived in Brisbane. I went done all my schooling in Brisbane, high school, primary school. Then I went over when I was 21. And they saw me as, um, <clears throat> uh, oh, they saw me as like a potato. I'm brown on the outside but I'm white on the inside. Okay. Uh. Yeah, it's kind of like coconut. A real coconut. Uh, do you want to... Be... <laughs> Sorry, I can't make that. Uh, so anyway, uh, when, I, when I was over there, one of, one of my fears is a fear of heights. Fear... Anyone else has a fear of heights here? Oh, my goodness, I was terrible. Anyway, in my dad's village has these beautiful waterfalls. Beautiful waterfalls in my dad's village. And um, my uncle, me and my sister, my uncles, my uncles took me to this, oh, this waterfall. Beautiful. I, I reckon it's probably like 20, 25 meters high. And, and I'm looking down, and so they, you know, it's, it's, it's just amazing. Anyway, I thought, you know, I'm afraid of heights. I said to my sister, take my camera. Take my, t- I'm going to stay down here. Take a photo of me up there. So, I walk, I, so here I am. One of my uncles climbed right to the top of this, of this waterfall. This, um, uh, I got right, and, and as I got there, I thought, you ready? Just, you ready? Okay, great. She's going to take a photo of me, and I'm afraid of heights. And so I, I get up there, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm geeing myself up. Okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to conquer my fear of heights. I'm, so I'm now standing there, and now... I take, uh, I walk closer, and I'm now I'm right at the edge. I'm right at the edge, and I'm thinking, don't look down, just jump. Don't look down, just jump. I get, and now I'm like, I'm trying to figure out how to stand. Now I'm like, I'm like this, I'm like this. I'm like, oh, should I go like this? But now I'll go like this. I got my hands up. I'm right at the edge. I got. I tell my sister, now take the photo. She takes the photo. Now, do you think I jumped? <laughs> Someone pushed me. They should have pushed me. Uh, who, who reckons I jumped? <laughs> One person. Gee, thanks, everyone else. <laughs> because you're right, I didn't jump. I got right to the edge, and I didn't jump. I just couldn't do it. I got right to the. I was right there, and my toes were like dangling over the at the top of the cliff. And I was standing there, I was ready, and I just couldn't do it. And it made me think. It made me think of the Israelites in Numbers 14. They were right there. They were right there. And all they had to do was to overcome that fear, and they just couldn't do it. And I thought to myself, sometimes, that's like us at church. We can be standing right at the edge, We can look like we've got it all together. We take the photo like we've got it all together. But then fear overcomes us. Do you get where I'm going? I wish I could preach for an hour, but I can't. This morning, we can get right there and our fear overcomes us. Look at Numbers chapter 14. If you can go there with me. 
Uh, let me read a few verse, couple of verses here. Uh, that night, uh, verse 1, Numbers chapter 14 and verse 1. That night, the people of, uh, of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt. Here we go again. If only we had died, and we covered this last week, so I'm not going to rehash it again. Or in this desert. Look at verse 3. What's the first word in your, in your verse 3? What's the first word? Why? Why? Hmm. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Asking the question, why? I think sometimes that's a dangerous question to ask. Why? When you, when you get to a point and you're stuck and you know God has led you there and you ask the question, why? You know what I think is a better question? Is what? Don't ask why. Sometimes don't ask why. Ask what next, God? Not why, God. Have you heard the question, why does a good God allow bad things to happen? You heard that question before? Why? Why does a good God allow bad things to happen? I'll tell you what I truly believe is if you're going to ask that question, there's another question you've got to ask together with that. If you're going to ask the question, why does a good God allow bad things to happen to good people, the other question you must consider is this. You listening? Is, well, sorry, what I, what I consider. A question that what I think I need to ask myself, what I consider, if I'm going to ask the question why, I need to also ask this other question. The other question is this. Is, why does God keep me here after I've messed up so many times? I've hurt so many people. I've messed up so many things in my family and in, in this world. Why does God keep me here? Do, do, do you follow what I'm saying there? If you're going to ask that question, I, I think you've got to consider that question as well. But here they ask the question, why? Why God? I love it when, um, when when, when, God, uh, when Job asks God, when Job asks God, and I love, jo- I love God's answer in uh, Job chapter 40, 40 to 42, I think it was, um, you know, Job said to, God said to Job, Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you? In other words, you're not going to fully understand. There are things on this side of eternity, you're not, not going to fully understand, you're, gonna, you're not going to be able to comprehend. Um, <coughs> so the answer question, Why? And, and here, the, did, did the children of Israel, did they want to enter the promised land? Did they want to enter the promised land? Okay, yes. They were looking forward to it for hundreds of years. When they were in Egypt, they looked forward to it. Let me ask you, why, what were they fearful of? What was it? They were, they were fearful of the giants. Okay, did the... Ten spies see the giants? Yes. Did Joshua and Caleb see the giants? Amen. They all looked at the same thing. All looked at the same thing. But what else did Joshua and Caleb see besides the ten spies? Oh, sorry, the ten besides the giants. What else did Joshua and Caleb see? <laughs> land of milk and honey, amen. That maybe beyond the fear, there's another reality, isn't there? Beyond the fear, there's also another reality. And, and this is the reality that, um, that Joshua and Caleb um, had caught, was when they'd looked at the same thing, but they had interpreted that a lot, a lot different. And they would have interpreted what they had seen as that God is able, that God is able to conquer it. God is able to conquer, uh, to, and to conquer their fears. Okay, um, and verse five. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their face in front of the whole Israelite assembly, gathered there Joshua, uh, Joshua, and also Caleb, and were among those who had explored the land. And their clothes uh, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, "The land we possess, uh, we passed through and explored, is exceeding." good is exceedingly good. Now, in order for the uh, in order for the Israelites to pass through 
the promise to, to acclaim the promised land. Um, actually, let me ask, did the Israelites get to the promised land eventually? Yes, they did. Joshua led them into the promised land. So whether they liked it or not, they were going to enter into the promised land. I've got five things, family, um, this morning. Five things. You know, the response of the Israelites reminds me of the response of the rich young ruler. You remember the rich young ruler? And he comes to Jesus and, and he says to Jesus, how can I have eternal life? How can I have eternal life? And what does Jesus say? Keep the, keep the commandments. And then, and what, and what does, what's the young ruler's response? Yes. All these I've kept. And then Jesus says, but there's just this one thing. What is it? Ah. Go and sell all you have and give it to the poor. So basically Jesus is saying this. He's saying, if you want to enter the promised land, I think there's only one condition. Is that you surrender all that you, all that you have and all that you are to him. All that you have and all that you are uh, to him. You know, when, uh, when Maylee was young, she had a bike. Uh, we, we, we bought her a little bike. She was probably too young to remember it. But I remember when I got, the, when I got the, the box, pulled all the parts out, I got the manual. What do you think I'd done to it? Whew, the, <laughs> I got the, yeah, the manual to tell you what to do, how to put it together. I got that manual. Oh, I don't need that. Threw it out, the, threw it out behind me. Put the whole bike together. It's one of those bikes where the kid sits on the bike, and at, at the back of the bike, there's this like a big long handle, and I can control it. So I'm pushing it like this. I control it back. And when I put all the, the whole bike together, there were like two parts sitting there. And I thought, that looks important. I thought, nah, should be right. So when I took Melee on the bike, the bike couldn't go left or right, it could only go straight. So I had to pull the whole bike part again. My point is this, is entering the promised land on God's terms, not yours. How often, how often do we sing that song, that Frank Sinatra song? <laughs> I stood tall, I did it my way. How often do we, we sing that song? We want to do it our way. You think the Israelites, they wanted the promised land? Of course they were looking forward to it, but they wanted to do it whose way? How about the other song? What about me? It isn't fair. Yeah. They want to do that. Five things, family, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to sit down. One, how do we enter the promised land? Now, don't get me wrong. Um, is that promised land, heaven, is God's gift to us. Amen? You can't earn it. You do nothing to earn it. We do nothing to achieve it. We are there because of God's grace and of what Christ done on the cross. Entering the promised land, uh, God wanted a relationship with his people. Five things. Number one is surrender your will to God. Don't do it your way. Let's do it God's way. Amen? Don't do it your way. Let's do it God's way. God's ways are higher, are better, are more beautiful than our ways. You know, the problem with that number one surrender is that when you look around, everything's all about you. What's your preference? You get to Macca's, what would you like? What flavor, what color? Everything's all about you. Like the Israelites. But to enter the promised land, they had to surrender that. Amen? Number one, now what we're talking, I'm not talking about how to get to heaven, no. Christ has already, he's already accomplished that for us. But how to have a deep and meaningful relationship with God. Number one is surrender. Surrender your preference. Surrender your will to God. Number two, I've got five things, so it's six, five things. Number two is submit to God's will for your life. Amen? Submit to God's will for your life. Number three is, you know, you will, you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Number three is seek God in prayer. Seek God in prayer. 
We're, I'm, I'm not talking about getting to heaven. No, Christ has already, he's accomplished that for us. But in order, uh, having a deep and meaningful relationship with him, we're going to be seeking him in prayer. Number four was something that was discussed in a um, Sabbath school this morning. Number four was, and number four is, search the scriptures. Thank you. Amen. Search. We can't have a deep and meaningful relationship with Christ if we're, if we're not going to take the time to search the scriptures. Search his will for your life. Be a, become a lifelong Bible student. Make, make the, the, the scripture, God's word, your lifelong study for all of us. It's a journey. Number five is surround yourself with spiritual people. Surround yourself. Who, who are the people that speak into your life? Who are the people that, that you surround yourself with? Surround yourself with, with, with uh, people who are, who are with God-fearing people. And I think the last one um, I had, I couldn't find a word that starts with S. Because surrender, submit, seek God in prayer, search the scriptures, surround yourself with spiritual uh, God-fearing people. The last one, I couldn't think of an S word, but I, I thought of wait, being patient, wait upon the Lord. Do you think, it, do you think um, the, the, the spiritual life is not something that happens immediately, but it grows, and sometimes we need to learn on how to wait. Now, to apply, how do we enter into a whole new normal? Um, I'm going to ask the panel, I've taken an extra five minutes of their time, if our panel is here, if we can come to the front, please, if you can make your way forward, when I get some seats out, and I, I, I believe, family, when we do those five or six things, five or six things, that we are turning our focus towards him, and that's what God wants for us to do, family. You know, when, as our panel's making their way to the front here, um, one of, when I was about nine years old, I went to a friend's house, and I couldn't swim. And my friend had a swimming pool. And me, it was, sorry, it was me and my brother and my cousin. And, I, and I, I fell into the water in the deep end. And I was in trouble. I didn't realize that you had to kick your legs. I was using my arms. And I was just coming up and just kept going back down. And I could feel my stomach filling up with water. And I was thinking, I'm in real trouble here. Luckily for my cousin, he, he pulled me up out of the water. And from, from that day, I had a big fear of water. I just couldn't go near... Um, I was about nine. And then in grade seven, in grade seven, we had a year seven camp. And we went. I didn't know that there was a swimming activity there. <laughs> swimming activity. And I tried to avoid that with all of, everything. I tried everything to avoid that swimming activity. But then I had to go. I had to go. And a teacher, he noticed, a teacher noticed that I, I was avoiding swimming because I had a big fear because of that experience of mine. And this is, what the teacher, this is what the teacher done to me. He grabbed me, oh, she grabbed me by the hand, and what do you think she said? She said, I'll jump in with you. I'll jump in with you. She grabbed me by the hand, and she said, I'll jump in with you. And I'll always remember that, because when we're facing fear, God grabs our hand, and what does he say? Yeah, he says, I'll jump in with you. You don't have to walk it alone. The Israelites were looking at themselves. What can we manage? They weren't looking at God. Those five or six things, family, is to, is to focus our direction towards him. Put our, put our, our total focus in on God. And when we can do that, because he's the one that's, that has overcome fear.